one more time and welcome to our Advent for a Sunday service. But today we are focusing on Jesus because we want to understand who was this babe that came? Who's the babe that we actually celebrate at the Christmas time? And today is our communion time. Every first Sunday of the month we take communion and we take it as community. So we want to know why communion? Why is it so important that the Lord has instituted this one sacrament to do it until he comes again? So Christians, followers of Christ from around the globe for now 2,000 years have been doing this remembrance until he comes. But what is it? And what is the significance of communion? So let's go ahead, get our elements ready. So we understand, get the fruit of the vine being close to you and get a cracker, uh, a representation of the bread. Thank you for those on Zoom that are showing your elements. Appreciate that. For those of you that are watching us later, you can do that. It doesn't have to be the first Sunday of the month. Jesus said, just do that in remembrance of me on a continual basis. Whenever you're listening, join us. Grab the elements that represent Jesus' blood, Jesus' body. And we actually going to be talking about what is it? What is, is there any magic? There is no magic. In the Christian faith, there is no magic. There is a magnificent, miraculous power that is unleashed every time we're in the presence of God. He's the creator of the universe. And that creator humbled himself, came into a human form as a babe that we celebrate at Christmas. And then as he was getting ready to give his life for you and for me, he gave us this one thing to remember and do until he comes again. Because the Advent season is celebration of Jesus Christ as a little babe coming into the world, but also during that Advent season, we celebrate that he is coming again. So let's go ahead and read the scriptures with which we will begin. And it's in Luke 22, verses 19 to 20. And also we will look at Matthew 26, 29. This is the words of Jesus. If you have your hard copy, please go ahead and prepare it. It's good to read from your hard copy. Uh, some of us read from our um, phones or wherever else, you know, on the iPads, whatever you used to read scripture from. Go ahead and, and uh, get it to have it handy. And the reason I want you to have it is because, especially if it's a hard copy, it's great to write in the margins. When the Lord gives you an insight and you pen it down and you open scriptures again and again, you can read these insights. And it's so amazing to, to see the progressive revelation that God gives you as you're reading his word. So let's go ahead and read Luke 22, verses 19 to 20. And um, this is what it says. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, take the cracker and just, just show. So he took bread. Uh, their bread was flat, kind of like crackers that we have, you know, with unleavened. So it's not uh, a fluffy big thing. And, and, it, and when he broke it, there is this sound that everybody heard. So he breaks when, when you break bread. Uh, as I said, it's not the fluffy thing that, 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 that there is no crack. You know, he, There is a sound and it shows that it's broken. So he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he's building the understanding, so they were doing the Passover. The Passover pointed to there will be a lamb. There was a, a Passover um, was a representation of the lamb that was slain for them and they were spared. The, uh, the judgment of God has come onto a land that has uh, mistreated people in slavery. They were mistreated in slavery. So God comes and judges the land. But those that had the lamb of the blood applied over their doorposts, over their 
um, umbrellas over their houses, whatever they were in, they were protected. And so they knew what the Passover was about. This is what they were celebrating. And Jesus takes the bread, you know, that's traditional uh, at that time uh, for the Passover. And he breaks it and says, now, you know about a lamb that was slain and that was a representation of, of that blood that covers mercy shown to you and not judgment. But now from here on, you have to understand the new thing is happening. So this is now my body that's broken for you. So I just want you to put yourself into the shoes of those that were partaking, because we know this beautiful picture that most um, have seen or some have in their homes, you know, hanging, you know, the last supper, Jesus and his apostles gathered and they're doing the last supper. Can you be one of those apostles seated by Jesus and Jesus is saying, here, 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 this bread, you know, this is, that's broken. This is actually me, my body that is broken for you. He's, he hasn't been crucified yet. They haven't caught, you know, the, nobody has arrested him yet. I mean, they, they, they know that some people hate him and there is, uh, there is this, uh, uh, up evil that is that is arising around Jesus. You know his his followers are kind of sensing all of that, and Jesus has already told them and beginning to prepare, but they couldn't grasp that. So you with Jesus, you know, I'm taking you somewhere because that's a great insight we're going to be uh, taking uh, today. He's saying, "I am instituting something new." So this is my body, and then he continues in the same way. In what way? This new way. He takes a bread and says, this is me, my body. And then he says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Wow. So I want you to, to catch these, these uh, couple of words because we're going to really unpack them. He says, this cup is the new covenant. New, kenos, covenant, diatiki. We'll major on those. I love going and doing deep dives with the original text, with the original covenant. It, this is in Greek. You know, it's written, the New Testament's written in Greek. So uh, when he says, this cup is the new, he says, this cup is the kenos, diatiki the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It's before it's poured out and they sit there and they, they're looking at him and they're thinking, what are you talking about? It is, wow, this cup that we've been taking that, that all of our uh, you know, parents and, and uh, lineage has been taking for, for centuries. Now you're saying, wow. So, so they're beginning to wrestle in their minds uh, beginning to connect the prophetic words that were spoken about Jesus. They had the kind of the notion that, yeah, he, he probably is the Messiah, yet they couldn't quite grasp what it, what, it, what was he talking about when he said, and, and, and I'll be killed, and then in three days I'll rise again. They really couldn't, couldn't put all of that together. So this is what's happening during this Last Supper, where he is instituting the sacrament of communion that you and I today are remembering Jesus by. Said and do that in remembrance of me. And as I said, through real life church in this digital virtual church community, we remember him every first Sunday of the month by taking the elements together. I wanna also read you from Matthew 26 verses 29. And it says this. And again, you can um, open your, your Bibles and, and read it in your hard copies. And it says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new, kenos, with you in my Father's kingdom. See, for us to grasp what that begins to mean to his followers then and what it means to his followers now, meaning to you 
and me, we have to remember that there are two words in the Greek language that we use for you. In, in the English language, I mean, we think we have a, um, a rich language, but, but sometimes it, it's impoverished to compare to the depths of what the original language tells us about our faith. So in the Greek language, they were using two words for new, neos, neo, which our new come from right there. And, and that particularly signified new in terms of age. You know, something is young, something is brand new, just a newly born babe, you know, something is new like in that sense. And then, but he doesn't use this word. He's not saying, okay, so this is a new covenant as something that is just now birth. He goes way deeper than that because literally this whole covenant was prophetically set way back. And we can read about that in the Old Testament. That's why they were celebrating the Passover. So in that respect, it wasn't like just now all of a sudden and they just uh, somehow, you know, instituting the bread and the cup for some unknown reason. They actually knew where it came from, but he uses the word kenos, which means new, but that was in particularly new to substance. So I want to read to you the translation of the word kenos. Kenos in Greek, in English new, it means of a new kind, unprecedented, novel, uncommon, unheard of. So Jesus was saying to his disciples, so here is what we have said, we're doing the Passover, and I know that we all know that it's an old kind of tradition that we have been used to, we understand it, we know what it points to, that, that our sins can be, um, you know, if there is blood applied, that, that's the whole idea in the Old Testament, something, some, someone dies in your place in order for you to be covered by the innocence, and, and, and so they were doing animal sacrifices, um, they would sacrifice a lamb or or go the bull that was without blemish and and just not because that animal was able to absorb in itself all the wrongdoing of the humans but it was a representation that that something without blemish without anything wrong sheds its own life in behalf of somebody that is wrong, that he has done wrong, that is doing wrong. But, but when that blood was shed, it was a representation and was, it was offered as a sacrifice to God. You know, it was a representation that there will come a time when there will be a lamb that would do the sacrifice once and for all for everything in the past, everything in the present, everything in the future, because he's the only one who was sinless without the blemish but he also was able to be the high priest who can offer the sacrifice to God it is so amazing to begin to understand but his followers his disciples were just sitting with him and observing this I'm almost sure in bewilderment because what he was doing is truly kenos it was unheard of it was unfathomable See, one more time, what is kenos? It is something of, of a brand new substance. It is of a new kind. It's unprecedented. It's novel. It is uncommon, unheard of. So they're sitting and doing something that their forefathers had done over and over for so long. And here Jesus comes in and interrupts all of that and says, okay, from here on, I will be establishing a new covenant, unheard of. It is totally novel. It is of a different substance. And you must remember, and in remembrance of that new covenant of who I am, in remembrance of what I'm establishing, you have to do that until I come again. 
It is so interesting. Let me tell you what he was talking about. In Jeremiah 31, 31, we have a scripture that is repeated almost word for word in Hebrews 8, 8, 10. Uh, for those of us that may not be quite familiar with all of the, the books of the Bible and, and uh, all of the beautiful truths that are written there, Jeremiah is a prophet in the Old Testament that God used to awaken his people Israel, that, that he set aside as a nation to point to the only one true God, to the creator of the entire universe. So he has set Israel apart from all nations, not because they were better than anybody else, not because they were sinless, not because they were doing everything right. Actually, he would go often after them to say, I loved you, although you, you've done all of that and, and, and you turn your back on me, but he singled them out so they can point to the God of the entire universe. But they were not doing very well in terms of serving God and uh, in, in worshiping him in the ways that, that God required. Because the way God requires you and I to worship is to honor his laws, to honor his rules for flourishing for his entire creation, for your flourishing. Mm -hmm. But human beings think that we know better and we know better than our creator. And we break these rules, these parameters for human flourishing. And, and so that's what the nation of Israel kept doing over and over. And uh, God was saying in Jeremiah, in a prophetic way, that's written also in Hebrew 8. And Hebrew is written after Jesus already was crucified on the cross and then resurrected. And Hebrew gives us this insight of what is this new covenant that Jesus instituted. Here is what it says, Hebrews 8, 8 to 10, which is exactly the same that said in Jeremiah 31, 31. For he finds fault with them when he says, God finds fault with the nation of Israel that he chose to point to him to be a model for all nations in the world. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant. And here the words are the same that Jesus uses at the um, Last Supper. Kenos diatiki. So again, I will establish kenos diatiki. I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wow. So the new covenant is that now God is writing his parameters for living, his parameters for flourishing, the things that actually would would bring us into community with God, into communion with one another, for flourishing one another, that new covenant will be written on our hearts and our minds. And we just talked about renewing our minds. And the thing is that if we control our minds, prepare our minds for action according to human parameters, what we as human cultures think is right, then, then that doesn't necessarily flourish us. One culture may think, you know, one nation or, or in one season, we may think that this thing is right. And then comes another culture and comes another nation or comes another group of people and they cancel that culture and say, this is horrible. This is stupid. This is not for flourishing. We're just going to go this way. And then comes another people and then comes another season and comes another century. And a group of people come and say, oh, no, these parameters are not for flourishing. We're just going to cancel that culture. Culture, and we're going to go in that way. And then comes another culture and another people. And we come up with rules and laws that we say and regulations that we guide our own nations or our 
our own group of people, we say this is good and this is flourishing and this must be the established eternal parameter, but it is not because another group of people comes and cancels what we have established. And God is saying, if you only pause, if you only stop, you will know that I have come and I have written a new law in your heart and in your mind. And you need to come in communion with you. If you are my people and I am your God, then the parameters, the rules that you're going to guide your, your groups, your countries, your cities, your states, these parameters would be truly flourishing parameters for you. They would be these laws that are going to be an, an uplifting and, and changing in a good way. It's a transformational building up, not tearing down. Because with human rules, with human parameters for flourishing, it usually builds up one group, tears down another group. And what God is establishing is his laws. And he's saying, I am for everyone. I don't want to leave even a small amount, a fraction of people that are not taken care of. I want everybody to flourish. But the only way everyone would flourish, if my new covenant is written, if my new contract is written in the minds of people, and you align with what I have established from the very get-go, from the creation, I have established what flourishes you. And whatever you come against, that begins to tear you down. And there are so many people and so many groups and so many laws right now through so many countries that are for tearing and not building up. And we are wondering why our cultures begin to unravel. It is because we have turned our backs to the only God, to the only creator of the entire universe who not only loves us and established his laws but he came and gave his only begotten son who came as a baby this is what we celebrate at the advent season he came and he said what you have known in the past from god's laws and you couldn't quite keep them now i am establishing a new covenant where the laws, the parameters of flourishing that God wants to establish among all human cultures are not just going to be written in stone tablets like it was as God wrote it on the tablets, giving the laws to Moses, the Ten Commandments to, to Moses, and then expanding those and explaining what that looks like. Uh, but the Israelites couldn't really keep those commands and those laws. Jesus is saying, I am coming to establish a new covenant. And if you receive me as the sacrifice, as the blood that's going to be shed and put on the parameters of your living, on the, the head posts of your houses that you build around yourself, this encirclement, these places that you say, this is my safe place. If you apply my blood on these head posts, that will mean that you will enter in kenos deatikos, in an unheard of, brand new, uncommon, nobody had ever even foreseen it contract. And that would be the cause covenant contract. I want to read what it what it means in English. So the cause is the the Greek word, and it means a contract, but especially a divisory will, meaning that somebody leaves their will when they die, when there is a shed blood. You know, the the life uh, of that person, you know, goes. Um, away, then that will is being established. And usually when, when people go and they, they hear a will being read, um, then they the divisor makes sure that the will is done to the T of the rule that's established within the will. You know, nobody can, can change the will of a dead person, right? You know, it's the will, that's divisory will. So this is what that deity means. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to be establishing kenos, an unheard of, brand new, completely by substance. In, in that sort of thing, it's just completely out of, 
unfathomable thinking. You have not even begun to grasp what I'm establishing. I'm establishing that particular divisory will, that covenant, that testament. Because this means a disposition, the, the translation, a arrangement, which one wishes to be valid. The last disposition which one makes of his earthly possessions after his death, a testament or will. And Jesus is saying, nobody can break that because I'm making it. It's on my life. I am pouring my blood for you. And so when I establish this cannot see at the cost, this unfathomable, unheard of covenant with you, nobody can take it away. And what that covenant means is that when you receive me as the substitute sacrifice, you receive my sacrifice that dies on your behalf because you are sinful, I am sinless. When you make that uh, exchange, then I write these laws. The parameters of flourishing now are in your mind. This is what renewing your mind means. We open our understanding and we read what God's laws are and where he is leading us to go. And we allow our minds to be prepared to act according to his laws, according to his parameters for flourishing, not what another People group is telling us, not what another culture is telling us, not what they did a hundred years ago, not what it seems like the majority is doing now. It is like, are we aligning with what God has spoken over the generations of human existence, that these are his laws, his parameters for human flourishing. And these are the things that Jesus writes in our minds and we prepare to act upon them. And then he writes them in our hearts so we are passionate about and we stick with that. And this is what Jesus established. This is the new covenant that he established. Can you imagine if you sat with him at that last supper, you would be blown away you would be saying, wow, what? So now your loss would not be an external, kind of like a heavy burden, but it's going to be an internal driver. Now you're putting all of the beautiful rules within me. I desire them because I know you. Because I now know you, you have become my eternal sacrifice, my eternal high priest that, that brings forgiveness. Every time I come with all of my sins, all of my trippings to you, but also you have become my eternal lawgiver because now my heart and my mind is aligned with where you are taking me where you are taking your church your body and we can stand strong in you and this is what jesus calls us to remember until he comes we live with a new covenant with him within that new covenant and god says i will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and i will be their god and they shall be my people there is no my god in my church because when he says my people he means israelites and all of us that are that are really uh, grafted into the New Testament church. So everybody that believes in God is the creator of the universe who establishes his rules and parameters for living. Unless we understand and do the new covenant where we allow Jesus to undergird everything we believe in and to feel everything we feel. This is what God does. He changes our minds and he changes our hearts because when we receive jesus we become new creations that creation is of a new substance because it exists in a new covenant it is kenos the etikos it is brand new substance with a with a will with a brand new covenant with the almighty only creator of the entire universe what a privilege to be god's people who do god's covenant this unfathomable completely brand new covenant
and that covenant, that will. See, everybody flocks to, to a relative that has written a will, hoping that something is left. Like, like even if it's like um, some crumbs from their wealth is left for them, right? And they go to the attorney, whoever is like really um, adjust in reading the will, and they are hoping. There isn't, you and I shouldn't be just like hoping or wishing that, that something is left for us. Everything is given to us. We have the will, this new covenant from Jesus. And he is saying, I am the substitute for everything that you've done wrong. And it's my righteousness that you're wearing. And it is knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ is eternal life. I'm actually giving you eternal life. You will eternally exist with me. For you and I have a beginning, my friend. We have a beginning date. And then we have a dash. And that dash represents what you and I do with the new covenant, with the kenos theotikos that Jesus Christ established in this earth. And then when another date is being put on a tombstone, that date is not really representing the end of your life because you continue to exist eternally. You have a beginning. You don't have an end. But it shows where you spend the rest of that eternity. Is it with God? Because you enter that cannot steal the cause, that new covenant with Jesus, or have you turned your back to God? Because the cannot steal the cause establishes new thinking and new feeling. It establishes new culture. This is what Jesus is saying. And remember the new culture that now you have as born again Christians for you. Uh, housing the laws, the parameters of flourishing that God gives, you're housing them in your minds and in your hearts. And that is what we celebrate with communion. Friends, we are so happy you joined us today. And we want to invite you again. I'm Pastor Svetlana, lead pastor of Real Life Church. We want to invite you to join Real Life Church if you don't have another place to call home. We have a wonderful faith community that gathers on Sundays around these screens, some of them from homes and some of them outside in, in the beautiful backyards, front yards. We invite you, it doesn't matter where you are, technology makes it possible for us to gather as a faith community, and we do that on a regular basis. And now in our Zoom group, we will proceed taking communion from the elements, but we want to invite you to come and be a part of that next time and from here on so you have a faith community to practice your faith. We just want to pray over you, and if you don't know Jesus Christ, now is the time to enter this new covenant with Jesus. Father, we are so grateful for what you have done in our lives. We praise your holy name. We glorify your Father. And we just pray for our friends that are listening right now, and maybe those that don't know you yet. I'm just praying that their hearts will be open, that they will say, Jesus, write your wrongs on my mind and on my heart. Here's my life. I exchange all of my sinfulness for your sinless life. And I thank you that you give me a new slate on life. And now I can be back with you. Friend, if you invited Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, I just want to welcome you to the family of God and say welcome to the first day of the rest of your life, living it in community with God and those who know him, his church. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful day.